anyways, um, let's uh, start. So I'm going to go over a bit of int introduction of who I am and how I got into photography. I'm going to talk about uh, some camera gear things, camera settings, uh, lighting and composition, um, then some tips for some different scenarios you might be shooting in. Then we'll go over some editing. I'll edit a photo and then we will do the question and answer period. Um, so introduction, my experience. So uh, if you don't know me, my name is Braden Kelly. I'm a fourth year uh, Augustana student and the vice president of the Augustana Outdoors Club. And I've been into photography for a long time now. So growing up, my family would always take me outside on trips and hiking and stuff. And the scenery is so beautiful. I just would always want to take pictures of it. So I started out with a little point and shoot camera, eventually graduated to this kind of bridge camera, and then eventually got the camera I have now, which is uh, a mirrorless uh, crop sensor camera, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, and so I've been at it for a couple of years and through a lot of trial and error and learning from other people, I've picked up some skills. Um, I wouldn't call myself a professional photographer, although I have made money off of photography, but it's definitely a hobby that I'm quite serious about and I enjoy a lot. So I'm happy to answer any of your guys' questions that you have in this or beyond this, and I hope I can teach you something today. Um, so let's start off with uh, what camera is best? So that's a pretty common question. If you ever follow any photographers online, pretty much all their comments will be, what camera is this? What camera is this? So um, it's kind of a common thing that a better camera would take better photos, but that's not always the case. So here are some common options people have. Um, so number one is the smartphone. Uh, I've got an iPhone here, but Android phones are just as good, sometimes even better. Um, so most phones now have pretty amazing cameras. I'm honestly always blown away by how incredible phone cameras are. And you can do just about anything with a phone camera these days. There's even newer ones that have a portrait mode or can shoot in low light conditions, which is quite stunning. Um, so if that's all you got, that's great. Like you can take amazing photos with a phone. Uh, next up is kind of this one. It's more of like a point and shoot. Maybe your parents have this one. It's kind of just like um, good for basic photos, not too much better than a smartphone, but it's got a bit of a zoom, which is nice. Um, then there's this one kind of moving up the, uh, the rungs of this one is a kind of a, a bridge camera or sometimes they're called a super zoom camera. So this is what I started out with. And these are great cameras. So, um, and all these different cameras, there's models that are made in the different brands. So the main brands are like Canon, Nikon, Sony, Panasonic, there's lots of different brands and they all will make a different model of this. So this is the Nikon version. And with this camera, um, it can zoom really far. So this one I think has like a 40 times zoom. And these cameras are really, really good for starting out or if you just wanna do kind of wildlife stuff or anything that requires a big zoom. Um, and they're really good cameras, but you can't change this lens. Um, so next up would be kind of like this crop sensor camera. So again, the different brands make different iterations. This is the Canon version. I have a similar one to this. I've got the Sony a6000. So that's like the Sony equivalent. And this is like a crop sensor camera. So it's a little bit smaller. Uh, it has interchangeable lenses, which is really nice and gives you lots of versatility. Um, but it, because it has that crop sensor, it means it has a smaller sensor. So I'll get into that a little bit when I talk about lenses. But if you were to put like a 50 millimeter lens on, it would actually be similar to like an 85 on a full frame. So it just crops your image a little bit, but you can account for that with different lenses. And then this is a full frame camera. So full functionality, professionals use these, they're great. Um, but these two are quite similar, honestly. Um, and, but what I always like to say is the best camera is the one you have. So uh, if you want to, you can go out and buy a nicer camera, but honestly, um, you can take great photos with whatever camera you have. So um, next up, I have this little exercise. So I've got these five photos here. So I want you to kind of think about which camera do you think would help to take each of these photos? Like which of these photos do you think were taken with each camera that I showed on the last slide? Um, so just think about that for a little bit and then I'll in 10 seconds, I'll show what the answer is. So um, just look at all these different photos. Okay, so now that you've thought about it, thought maybe, um, maybe these photos were, some of them were taken with the bigger camera, maybe some of them were taken with iPhone, but actually these photos are all iPhone photos. So I just looked up um, kind of like the best iPhone photos of the year and there's tons of good ones. So I just wanted to do this slide to show that even if all you have is a smartphone, even if it's a, a older phone or an Android phone, you can still take incredible photos with it. Um, so don't feel limited by what you have, um, just make the best of it and you can take really good photos with whatever gear you have. Um, 
Another thing to consider if you're looking to buy a new camera, and you don't have to be, but if you are, uh, is this mirrorless versus non-mirrorless or DSLR. Um, so DSLR cameras are older and they have a big mirror in them. Um, and so the way it works is the light comes in and it hits this big mirror and then goes up into the viewfinder. And then you can kind of see directly what's out of your camera. Um, so they're a bit bigger, a bit older, um, but the battery lasts way longer. Mirrorless is what I have. Um, and that's kind of the way of the future for cameras. A lot more cameras are becoming mirrorless. It just skips the mirror entirely. The light goes straight through and hits the sensor and then it goes to an electronic viewfinder. So it's like a little screen up here. So the battery isn't as good, um, but they're really light and compact. So I quite like them for uh, travel photography and whatnot. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk about lenses. So um, lenses are really important. Um, if I was to advise someone buying a camera, I would say, don't worry as much about the camera body. Think about what kind of lenses you're gonna get. So you'll get a couple different kind of lenses. So you have a fixed lens. So if you had, let's go back, if you had, uh, this camera or this camera, you have a fixed lens. You can't change it. It's just what you got. Usually they can zoom a little bit. Um, so they're not bad, but they're a bit limiting when you try to get better at photography. Um, you'll have a kit lens. So if you buy like a entry level camera like this one, the Sony, it'll come with a kit lens. And so my kit lens is um, I think 16 millimeters to 50 millimeters. So it's got a little bit of a zoom. It can, the f-stop can kind of drop down a little bit. So it's kind of a do everything lens and it's a pretty good starter lens. Um, if two other lenses you might want to consider investing in, depending on the type of photography you want to do, um, would be a zoom lens. So this is the zoom lens I have. It's um, 55 to 210. So it can zoom quite a ways in. And then more importantly, I would say is the prime lens. So this is the prime lens I have. It's um, 30 millimeters, but with the crop sensor on my camera, it's equivalent to about a 50. Um, so prime lenses are, are really good. I'd say getting a prime lens was a pretty big game changer for me. So with a prime lens, um, this is another example of a prime lens. Some of them can get quite small, but with a prime lens, you can't zoom in or out, but you can drop your aperture all the way down um, to like an F1.4 or F1.6. And we're gonna talk about aperture in another slide here. Um, but for example, you can see aperture when you can drop it down, it allows you to shoot at low light and it allows you to blur the background, which is quite desirable when you're shooting portraits and stuff. Um, and so different prime lenses will have different effects on a photo. So this GIF is pretty cool. It shows at different, shooting the same person from the same distance with different lenses, it shows kind of the compression and how it can change their face. So it can actually have a quite a big difference depending on what size of prime lens you decide to shoot with or what size um, of lens you shoot with. And then this is another graph just showing so this one, the top bar here is all shooting the same girl from different distances away or the same distance, sorry. And so you can see the 24 is like this and all the way up to the 135 is quite zoomed in. And this one is backing up. So with the 24, um, they would be standing probably pretty close. With this 135, they'd be standing quite far away to capture this. Um, so different prime lenses will do different things. And I'm kind of, as we're going here, I'm kind of just doing a brief overview with all these things. If you're more curious, um, feel free to ask more questions at the end or definitely Google these things. There's lots of good resources online and on YouTube for this kind of thing. Um, in terms of non-camera gear, uh, it's just a couple of things you could consider. Uh, tripods are, are okay. A lot of landscape photographers will use tripods. They're especially useful if you wanna do any long exposures or astrophotography. Um, if you're not thinking about doing that, you might not need one. Um, so there's this kind of standard tripod. I have one like this. Um, they're handy, but they're big and bulky. So if you're going into the back country, they're maybe not the best. Then there's these little Gorillapod Joby ones. I really like these ones. They're quite small and you can attach them to your camera. And then these legs are all bendy. And so you can get creative with it. So you can attach it to your pack. You can find a rock and put it on it. And they're just, they're, they work really well. I like those a lot. Um, it's good to have a couple spare batteries. I have three because mine's a mirrorless and they die kind of quick. SD cards, it's always good to have an extra one. So if yours fills up or corrupts, you have a backup. Um, you might want to get a wireless remote. I currently don't have one, but I'm thinking about getting one. That way you could take self portraits um, or you can just use them if you're doing a time lapse. And then an external hard drive is good if you get more seriously into photography and you just have a ton of images. Um, it'll start to fill up your computer and eventually um, you don't want to slow your computer down. So you would want to have. Uh, an external drive. Um, so now we're going to get to the camera basics, as I mentioned. So 
some of this, some of you guys might already know, this is pretty basic intro to photography, but I'm just going to quickly go over it in case people need a refresher or people don't know. So uh, as you start to get more into photography, um, it's really good to get off of the auto mode and switch to manual if you can. Um, it just gives you a lot more freedom and a lot more control of your images. Um, so when you're in manual, you have three things to consider uh, when you're thinking about shooting a photo and exposing it properly. So you have uh, your aperture, which is this part of the triangle. You have your uh, ISO, which is this part of the triangle. And you have your shutter speed, which is this part. So they're all about letting amounts of light into your camera. So aperture is how much um, the camera will open. So an F16 would be a deep depth of field. So it would be a tiny slit, so it wouldn't let a lot of light in. And on the flip side, F1.4 would be shallow depth of field and it would let a lot of light in. And so that would be what would blur your background. If you're taking portraits, you might want that. Um, and so to get to F1.4, F2, F2.8, you'll probably need a prime lens. Um, and then if you're shooting kind of landscape and you want the mountains or the background in focus, you might want to shoot it like an F16. Um, and then you have your ISO. So that's to do with the sensor in the camera. So typically with ISO, you want to keep it as low as possible because um, the higher you go, the grainier your photo will get. So it'll just get quite grainy at the end. If you go all the way up to 6,400 or even 12,800, you'll get quite a lot of noise in your photo and that's not very desirable. Um, and then the last one is shutter speed. So um, if you have your shutter, it's how long your shutter is open for. So if your shutter is open for one eighth of a second, that's actually quite a long time in terms of camera time. And so it'll kind of blur any motion that's in the photo and it'll let a lot of light in. If you have the opposite, uh, one over 1000, that's very quick. So you'll have, you'll freeze your subject, less motion blur, but you won't let a lot of light in. So typically my process when I'm thinking about exposing an image is I wanna keep it at ISO 100 if possible. And then I think, what am I shooting? If I'm shooting, let's say uh, a portrait, I'm saying, okay, I probably want this portrait to have a blurred background. So I'll probably do F1.4, maybe F1.2. So that's gonna let a lot of light in. And this is gonna let not a lot of light in. Um, so the other thing with ISO, yeah, it's brighter the further this way you go. So this net let, lets not a lot of light in, this will let a lot of light in. So then the shutter speed, I will then adjust accordingly to expose the image properly. Um, if let's say I was shooting someone in motion, like someone running, and I wanted to freeze them in motion, maybe I'd do this one. And so I would need to get a little bit brighter. So I would maybe drop this down and have a more open aperture. And then maybe I could also up the ISO. Mainly the only time that I would increase ISO would be if you were ha already had a wide open aperture and you couldn't shoot down here because it was too dark. So you were shooting something like this. Um, when you start to shoot up here, your photos are gonna be blurry unless you have a tripod. And so that in that case, I might increase ISO, but ISO is kind of more of a last resort. So I included these pictures as well. So this kind of shows the different apertures and the amount of um, blur they do the background. Um, and if you don't have a prime lens, you can also achieve this effect by shooting your subject really close. So if you get up super close to your subject, you can blur the background. Or if you have a zoom lens, you can back up and zoom in on them. And that will also help to blur the background. Um, and so that can be desirable depending on what you're shooting. With the ISO, like I said, the higher you go, the grainier it gets. And this is what I mean by that. So if you can keep it low, but also don't be scared to raise it a little bit, like going up to 1600 isn't very noticeable. So don't, you can do that. And then with the movement, like I said, faster will freeze your subject, slower will blur them. And sometimes like if you're shooting a waterfall, you might want to blur it. So you'd go down to this low. And this low, if you want it to not be super blurry, you might need a tripod. Um, okay, let's talk about lighting. So um, the last part was how much light we let into the camera. This part's about the lighting of your surroundings. Um, so most photographers will tell you, and I would agree that the best time to shoot is golden hour. So golden hour, is um, right around sunrise and right around sunset and a little bit after and a little bit before you just get really nice orange and gold tones and they really make your subject look nice there's no harsh shadows the worst time to shoot is probably around noon because at noon the sun is at its highest and you'll just get really bright photos often they'll be overexposed and they kind of can cast cast harsh shadows on your subject um, so definitely if you can shoot more towards the morning or more towards the night, but sometimes that's not an option. If you're doing an activity or a hike and it's the middle of the day, you just got to shoot with what you got. Um, so, um, I kind of showed a difference here. This photo up top is my friend Chelsea on the Icefields Parkway. 
and it was kind of the middle of the day so you can see there's kind of some shadows on her face it's still a good photo I still like it but um, it's not not as good as maybe this one which was shot around golden hour really well lit the light is like nicely lighting up her hair and just overall a really solidly lit photo um, if you do have to shoot during the middle of the day there are some tips and tricks you can try to maybe mitigate some of these shadows if you shoot your subject pretty much all in the shade that can help so I took this photo of my brother um, last weekend and he, it was really sunny out and bright so if we took it out in the light it would have been poorly lit but we went in the shadows and it turned out all right or with this one with uh, my roommate here you can kind of use trees or clouds to kind of block out the sun or partially block out the sun and just make it a little bit less, har less harsh and get good lighting. Um, you can see this diagram at the bottom too. If someone's staring right into the sun, they're gonna be squinty, it's gonna be not great lighting. With side, it's pretty good. Uh, sometimes it can get really bright on one side of their face and dark on the other, so it's not always good. Backlit is usually pretty good, especially if the sun is right behind them, kind of like this one, then you can get nice light. And then shade is good, but just because it's even light. Um, so those are all things you kind of want to think about when you're shooting photos, especially when you're shooting people. Um, okay, so let's talk about composition. So another piece of the puzzle when we're shooting an image is the composition. So there's kind of some, some rules that people kind of loosely follow, but honestly, I find with composition, uh, it tends to just kind of, uh, people usually kind of have an eye for it. And you, if you don't have an eye for it, you'll develop an eye for it. As you look at more photos and you take more photos, you'll kind of realize what looks good. So composition is all about kind of directing where the viewer looks. And so there's a couple of different ideas. Some people like to shoot kind of this golden ratio where they have kind of a curve in the photo. Some people like to use the rule of thirds where you try and place your subjects in these intersections on this grid line. Some people like to do leading lines where you kind of have the, all of these points in the photo all directing your eyes toward a, a central point. Um, and so these are all decent frameworks and they're good to work within. But sometimes the most interesting photos purposely break these rules. Um, so I included a couple of mine, my own photos for reference here. So this one in Hawaii, these stairs kind of can act as a bit of a leading line. Your eye kind of follows them up until, oops, until you can see the participants. Mm -hmm. Same with this one, the trail kind of goes to the participant and then continues on to the mountain. This one is using the rule of thirds a little bit um, there. And then this one also kind of uses leading lines to lead you all the way to the sun here. Um, so just some things to think about. And uh, these rules aren't set in stone. They're just some different ideas to make your photos interesting. One thing that I do think is quite important though, is if you're shooting landscape photography, I think adding a human element is really important. I think it really makes your photos uh, stand out and a lot more interesting. So I took this on purpose, the exact same photo with and without my brother, um, just to kind of show the difference here. Um, and I think adding the person makes it a much more interesting photo. It makes it as, so as a viewer, when you're seeing this, you think, wow, that looks really cool. That could be me, I could be there. You can kind of, insert yourself into the photo and it just adds an extra element of intrigue. So I think adding people to landscape photos, I'm quite fond of doing that, but you don't always have to, but I like doing that. Um, so if you're shooting kind of landscape adventure photography, um, these are some different tips you can think about. So if you're shooting more of like action sports, so this climbing shot or the skiing shot, you'd probably want to have a faster shutter speed. And you might even want to put your camera in a burst mode because there might be sudden movements that you don't want to miss. So you maybe you'll be shooting fast. So if you're shooting uh, fast shutter speed, you might drop your aperture down to maybe like an F 2.8 or something. You don't want to do it too low because you want most of the shot to be in focus. So you might have to raise your ISO a little bit. Um, and then landscape photo like these two, you would want to have your aperture higher. So you get more of the shot in focus. You get the mountains in focus and the person um, so maybe you shoot like an F8 or above. Um, and so you'd adjust your other settings accordingly. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's kind of all I had for that. Um, okay, so this is something I think is really important in photography is telling a story with your photo. Um, so I think even if a photo is maybe not technically composed very well or lit very well, I think if a photo tells a story, I think that is the purpose of taking photos to capture moments and tell stories. So these two photos in particular, um, they might not mean as much to you, but to me, these photos um, really tell a story and they really remind me of these trips. This is from a bike packing trip I did with my family and a couple other families in BC. And it just really reminds me of traversing these ridges and biking all around. This one is from another hike in BC my family did on the coast. 
And it's maybe not, definitely not my best star photo, but it was one of the first um, photos I ever took of the stars. It's got a little bit of a campfire here. And I just really um, remember this very vividly. And it, it brings back a lot of memories when I look at it. And so if you can evoke that kind of emotion in yourself from your photos or even better in other people, I think that is a really, the mark of a really good photo. Um, this is just a little video I made from a snowshoeing trip I did with Augustana. And same kind of thing, it's maybe not the best, it's a little bit blurry, there's a bit of shake, um, but just like the music and the composition, it really just reminds me of this trip. Um. So I got a bit of the movement of the smoke and kind of the sound of the wind and the crackle of the fire. And that for me, even though maybe it's not as in focus it could be, the sunset isn't as good as it was uh, maybe 30 minutes before I took this, but the, all those factors combined, I think it tells the story of that trip and is really reminiscent of that trip for me. So I really appreciate that as a little video clip to remember. Um, okay, so wildlife photography. So I don't know if some of you guys are gonna be into this or not, but um, if you'd want to do wildlife photography, probably the most important thing would be to have a zoom lens. You can sometimes get away with just a kit lens, but zoom lenses definitely help a lot. So these I took all with my zoom lens. So uh, main keys with wildlife photography is, is patience and then a bit of luck. Um, so you got to, depending on what you're shooting, if you're shooting birds, if you're shooting chickadees, you'll probably get a pretty good shot of a chickadee. But if you're looking to shoot bison or something more like a pine marten or something, you kind of have to either camp out in one spot or just get really lucky. And once you get lucky and see it, you have to be patient and sit still and kind of wait for them to do their own thing. And obviously do that all from a safe distance with your Zoom. Um, and so kind of the same thing with like the sports and action photography, you'll probably want a higher shutter speed because they could move suddenly. Um, and also another thing to consider is the background. Um, so especially with this downy woodpecker shot, um, I think what makes this shot is the golden background. It looks really nice. And um, so, whenever you're shooting animals, probably you're gonna to wanna to blur out the background a little bit so that the focus is on the animal itself. And so positioning yourself so that the background is interesting or has nice colors can make all the difference. So that's something to consider. Um, and then astrophotography. So this is a bit of a passion of mine. I really like taking pictures of the stars in the Milky Way. Um, and there's a lot of cool tricks you can do with it. So the thing with astrophotography is it's a lot of trial and error. Um, so you're gonna adjust your settings. Your settings for astrophotography will be probably like 15 to 30 seconds per photo for your shutter speed. So you need a tripod. Um, and then your focus, you probably won't just be able to just shoot it and have perfect focus. So you'll probably wanna switch your camera over to a manual focus if you have that. And then once you have your manual focus, you'll have to, your camera probably has a focus ring that you'll turn and you can try and get the stars in focus. And it's honestly a lot of taking a photo, you wait 30 seconds and then you check your camera and you adjust something, then you wait 30 seconds. So it's a lot of sitting and trial and error, but it's usually pretty nice stars when you're taking these photos and so it's worth it. Um, and yeah, definitely you would want a tripod. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Um, and these ones, you'll probably crank your ISO up so you might get a bit noisier photos. You can see this one, um, the foreground here is quite noisy. Um, one other tip I would say with astrophotography is it's really cool, I think, to have an interesting foreground. So this one I have, uh, the mountain here and some trees. This one I have these rocks and Joshua tree and this one I have myself on a dock. Um, so I think that makes the photo. If I just took this photo just like this with just the stars with nothing in the foreground, it would be really boring. And so to have a subject really grounds the photo and adds some interest as well. Um, and then with any lights, because you're taking it for 30 seconds, if I had my headlamp on for the whole 30 seconds, it would be super bright and overpower the image. So if you ever are shining a light on your subject, you'll only want to shine it for a couple of seconds, then you'll turn it off because, or else it'll just overpower your image. This one was kind of lucky. There was a flash from like a car going by or something and it lit up this rock for a second. Uh, and that's kind of all you need. Um, okay, so editing 101, what programs to use? So me personally, I use Lightroom, but I actually probably wouldn't recommend that if you were just starting out or not serious. So Lightroom uh, is a paid program. And unfortunately it's a subscription. So they do have a student rate, but it's still quite expensive. And so unless you have a way to make money out of your photography or um, you're really passionate about it, I would probably not recommend it. Um, so there's a couple options. So on mobile, there's, you could use Visco. A lot of people use that. They have nice filters. You could edit right on the Instagram app or you could use Snapseed, which is uh, an app from Google, I think. Those are all pretty solid choices. If you're on your computer, you could use Google Photos or Apple Photos. Those are decent. 
Um, if you want to use a paid program, but not a subscription, this one's called Affinity. I haven't tried it, but I've heard it's not bad. And then if you want a free computer program that has most of the features, there's this one, which is GIMP, which is kind of like a Photoshop knockoff. And there's this one, which is Darktable, which is like a Lightroom knockoff. And these are both free, but they're maybe a little bit harder to use. Um, kind of whatever program you use, it'll take you a little while to kind of figure it out, but you just kind of have to stick with it and commit to it and work on it. And eventually it'll get easier. But a lot of these have a bit of a steep learning curve. Um, and then one of the last things I wanted to cover is shooting raw versus shooting JPEG. So this is, along with prime lenses, this was another kind of game changer for me was shooting in raw. Um, so not every camera will shoot raw, but most will, uh, mine does. So uh, a raw file versus a JPEG, if you're shooting on your phone or uh, if you don't change any settings, your camera will shoot JPEG. So JPEGs are smaller file sizes because they're compressed. Um, they kind of process the image file uh, while you shoot it. And so you can just publish them immediately, you can view them immediately, but they um, don't have as much dynamic range. So you can look at this one, like if this is your original JPEG, this will be all you'll be able to edit out of it. But if the, you shoot it in RAW, the exact same scene, you'll be able to get a lot more of the shadows. So by shooting RAW, you s almost like, it's like you can almost redo your exposure in post-process. And you, when you go to edit it, you can get a lot more out of your shadows and highlights if you mess up when you're taking the picture. So I like to shoot raw, but um, that'll be depending on where you are at with your photography. JPEG is very good too, and I shot JPEG for a long time. Um, okay, before I get to these concluding thoughts, actually maybe I'll go through this and then I will edit a photo. So, um, so concluding thoughts, um, gear only matters so much, experience is far more important. I definitely believe that, um, but gear is nice too. Like if you are wanting to invest in this, there is gear that you can get that will make your life easier. Um, shoot and edit often to hone your skills. I think that's super important. Um, the biggest thing for me was just taking a lot of photos and editing a lot of photos. And over time, my skills and my style developed. Um, and then have fun and don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, so if you totally botch a photo, who cares? It's just a photo. Um, and try things. Try shooting with a different composition than you'd normally shoot. Try shooting with a different lens that you'd normally shoot. Try getting up early for sunrise. And it's, it's really fun to try all these things. So. Before the q and I'm just going to escape here and I'm going to go over to here. Oh, I'm going to stop the share. And then I'm going to reshare my screen with Lightroom. Okay, so here we go. So here's Lightroom. So this is an image that I took of my roommate, Sarah, in Grasslands National Park. This is um, the edited version that I did. So you can see it's actually quite a big difference, um, a raw photo to the edit. So different people will say different things about what percentage of photography is shooting it versus what percentage is editing it. Um, I would say maybe 60 to 70% is in the shot itself and then 30 to 40% in the edit. Maybe it's more. Um, so, and when different people have different philosophies when they're editing. When I edit, I try and make it look somewhat similar to how it looked in real life. I try not to make it look um, overly bright and stuff, but you, different people have different styles. So if I'm gonna go through and edit this, like I said, most of you guys probably won't use Photos or Lightroom, but a lot of you guys will use programs that have similar things. So pretty much all photo programs have these same basic controls. So even if you're using a different program, it will be kind of similar. So the first thing I like to do is go through and do any cropping. So as you can see, maybe you didn't notice, but the horizon line is a little bit um, crooked here. So I'm just gonna kind of try and fix that a little bit. Okay, and then it was really sunny that day. So I'm gonna warm this up because it was pretty warm that day. Um, I'm gonna make this a little bit brighter here. So your exposure is just kind of like um, how much light is in your photo in general. So if you're upping your exposure, upping your light, um, your contrast is kind of how much the different things in the photo kind of stand out from each other. So if you have low contrast, it'll kind of be bland. If you up your contrast, um, stuff will stand a bit more. So I like increasing my contrast. That's kind of a stylistic choice for me. Um, and then you can always go back and tweak other settings later. Highlights has to do with how much light is in your photo. So highlights is all the light in your photo. So the main light is coming from here, from the sun. So if I increase the highlights, that's gonna get really blown out. And that's maybe not what I want. Um, I try, like I try and think if my photo is gonna be on a white background on Instagram or on a website, I try and have it so it's not white in the sky. So I'm gonna actually drop my highlights a little bit and that'll recover some of the clouds here. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, I'm gonna lift my shadows a little bit because there's some shadows here. Um, let's see, there we go. And then 
Your whites and your blacks are to do with like the white parts of your image and the dark parts of your image. Um, so I think with these, I'm gonna drop them down a little bit. Blacks, I might drop down a little bit as well. I'm gonna go back and add a little bit more contrast. You can see up here this histogram. Um, you can sometimes see this in your camera too. So with your histogram, you kind of want to get kind of an even spread, mostly in the middle. You don't want it to be spiked at either end. Um, clarity, not all programs have this, but clarity just kind of adds a little bit of, I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of like contrast, but you can definitely overdo it. Like I don't want to do that and I don't want to go the other way either. So usually I'd be pretty subtle with this. Maybe I'll go plus 10. And then vibrance and saturation. Um, that just adds your, makes your colors more vibrant. I'm going to drop the saturation a little bit because I was looking a little bit unrealistic. Um, there we go. Put that here. Um, your tone curve. So with this, there's lots of different philosophies with how to edit this tone curve. Your tone curve kind of deals with all these, but in a more dynamic way. So I kind of like to do just like a little bit of an S, S shape. Um, there we go. That looks pretty good. And you can toggle it on and off even. I like how that looks. Um, Lightroom is really cool. It has, you can go through every single color in the photo and edit them. So let's say I wanted these flowers to pop a little bit more. I could click on them and really make them pop. Not every program has that, so I'll skip that. Split toning, you can put colors in your highlights or your shadows. I usually don't, wouldn't do that too much. Uh, sharpening, usually I do a little bit. I'll put up to 80 there. Um, I'm going to enable profile corrections because sometimes uh, it shoots it funny out of your camera. And then, yeah, that's about it for the main thing. So like I said, probably you guys won't all shoot edit in Lightroom, but um, Lightroom, every program you use, no matter if it's an app or a different computer program, it'll probably have these basic controls. So you can kind of go through a similar process. Another cool thing about Lightroom and, and some of the other programs is it has these masks. So this is a, a gradated filter. So let's say I just wanted to edit just the sky. So I could pull this down. And I can see, so this is now just affecting the sky. So let's say I wanted the sky to be a bit warmer. So I could take this and I'm gonna pull it up to here. And so you can kind of see the before and after. I just added a little bit of warmth to the sky. I kind of like how that looks. And then this one is just a brush. So let's say I wanted my subject to pop a little bit more. I could just brush my subject and then I could increase the contrast or I could increase the clarity. So lots of different little tools you can do um, and it's pretty sophisticated, but there is, you can do a lot of this with free apps as well. So uh, there's the before, there's the after. So the other thing with shooting in RAW is often the RAW photos look quite bland out of the camera because it's kind of saved a lot of the, the shadows and the highlights and a JPEG photo will kind of almost edit it a little bit for you. So RAW looks really bland, but once you edit it, you can get quite good results. So I quite like that. Looks a little different from the last time I edited it, but it looks good. Okay.